Hello, Geography 232 students. Welcome to week two of our class. Hopefully everybody is getting settled in and figuring out sort of the format that we're using this semester. Uh, all the labs, lecture notes, videos, um, reading assignments, all those are uh, being posted and available to you on Canvas in each week's modules. Uh, so here we are at week two. And we're going to continue the uh, subject of imagery. This week we're going to get into remote sensing and talk a bit more about satellite imagery. All right, so this week's lecture we're looking at uh, the history of remote sensing and elements of Im image interpretation. Um, along with this week's lecture, you also have a reading called The Big Eight Elements of Image Interpretation, and that looks at the eight elements that go into the subjective act of image interpretation, uh, identifying the tone the location, the shape, pattern, texture, all these various elements that help us as uh, viewers identify features on the landscape. So make sure you read that. Uh, and then for this week's lab, uh, it's a, it's a two-parter. So part one is get started with imagery, and that's going to walk you through Esri's uh, web aerial imagery viewer um, and task you with identifying features on the landscape. And then second is uh, elements of image interpretation, and you're going to do uh, basically apply the skills that you learn in part one to identify features on the landscape using the eight, eight elements. So for this week's lecture, uh, the outline includes uh, what is remote sensing, a history of remote sensing, aerial imagery, image interpretation, photogrammetry, and the electromagnetic light spectrum. So what is remote sensing? Uh, remote sensing is a verb. It's a, it is an act, right? So it is an act of remotely viewing distant objects, essentially. So it's an acquisition of information about a distant object or phenomenon using electromagnetic radiation and the interpretation of derived information products, or in short, bullet points, um, matter energy interactions recorded by sensors, processed with computers to enhance and derive information, and interpreted by the human brain and visual system. So it's the collection of visual data at a distance hence remote. For GIS, remote sensing generally means using photographic or satellite images to gather and analyze spatial data. Image acquired from satellites and aircrafts, including drones, um, are part of a process uh, broadly called remote sensing. Uh, remote sensing allows the collection of panchromatic imagery, um, the use of radar, lidar, microwave radiation, and multispectral satellite imagery. So these are all various uh, tools and or processes uh, to collect information about um, phenomena or objects at a distance. Uh, the data acquired by sensors are information about the light energy being reflected off a target. So whenever a photograph is taken or an image is, is sensed, all it is is a reading of the uh, photographic signature or the, the light signature um, bouncing off of any given object. All right, so just a couple of examples of remote sensing on the upper right. That should be a location that hopefully you're familiar with. That's the Cypress College campus. On the left, we're looking at uh, predominant vegetation across the United States. And then across the bottom, we are looking at several different, um, I guess, indicators of a given location. We have areas burned and not burned in a fire, uh, snow cover, uh, temperature gradients, and others. And these are all um, remotely sensed information, not necessarily images taken in a, a, a photographic, uh, you know, visual uh, representation of something you'd see with the naked eye, but actually data collected that can't necessarily be seen with the naked eye, for example, temperature, right? Another example, this is uh, the vegetation health index. So the health of vegetation across the world, um, darker blue, very healthy, red, not so healthy. It's 2020, and it's 2019. All right, uh, history of remote sensing. So the first photograph was actually taken in France by a gentleman named Joseph Nisifor Niebs. Uh, he took a photo uh, out of a window, and uh, that's what you see there. So that's the first um, existing photo that we have. 
1939, Louis Daguerre took a photo from the roof of a tall building in Paris. We might consider that one of the first oblique aerial images that uh, was ever taken. And uh, oblique is the term you'll hear in the context of aerial imagery, and it just means at an angle. Okay, so um, an, an oblique photograph is contrasted with an orthogonal or an ortho photo uh, in that those are at a right angle to the ground. So when you go into Google Earth and you look at Google Maps and you look at an imagery, those are orthogonal images that are um, taken at a right angle to the ground, whereas oblique is at an angle. The first true aerial image was captured by Gaspar Felix to uh, Tornachon. Uh, in 1858 using balloons and kites. Uh, they were essentially tethered together and he took a photo from the balloon. Uh, the oldest existing aerial photograph was taken by James Wallace Black in 1860 of Boston and that is the photo that you see there on the bottom right. 1903 Julius Neubrauner photograph, uh, phot excuse me, photography enthusiast designed and patented a breast-mounted aerial camera for carrier pigeons. So we can consider this uh, some early drone footage, if you will, obviously not actually drone, uh, but the, the output very similar to what you might see from compared to a modern drone. 1903, the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, and in 1908, the first aerial photograph by plane was captured. And then that technology was applied during the World Wars for reconnaissance, in this case here, World War I, mapping the trenches, World War II, identifying enemy positions, launch pads, barracks, tents, and so on. And uh, over the course of the 20th century, aerial imagery for, for a military application continued to advance. The U-2 planes famously famously flew at over 70,000 feet. Blackbird flew over 80,000 feet, and those were essentially, um, in, in the one sense, long-range bombers, but also um, military uh, reconnaissance vehicles for um, capturing capturing information, remotely sensed photos from very high up. Um, military applications continued with the application of drones during the 1990s and 2000s in the Middle East. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik into low Earth orbit. They orbited the Earth 1,440 times in three weeks. And while no photos were actually taken by Sputnik, uh, radio uh, transmissions were made between the satellite and Earth, one of the first times it happened. Uh, here is the first crewed photo taken in space, uh, 1959. Uh, the USA launches Explorer 6 and uh, captures a photo of Earth from space. 1960. Satellite imagery has continued to evolve uh, and to the point where now we have vast arrays of remote sensing satellites, both in a geosynchronous and a heliosynchronous um, orbit. So types of imagery that are collected, many different collection platforms, as I mentioned, satellites, manned aircrafts, drones, um, also many different types of of modalities or sensors. So we have thermal, radar, uh, electromagnetic, and uh, obviously traditional uh, you know, uh, visual light spectrum as well. Uh, and these are more than photos, or more than pictures are taken. These are spatially referenced, spatially referenced measurements. So a photo that's taken with your phone doesn't take into account the actual spatial dimensions of what it's, what it's viewing, whereas remote sensing satellites do. They take elevation, they take uh, the electromagnetic signature into account, and so it's a lot more than just a, a picture. Uh, other information can be taken from that, and you'll learn more about that in this week's lab. Um, these are used for visualization as well as analysis, spatial analysis. So what are the elements of aerial imagery? I mentioned already the difference between orthogonal and oblique, but here are two examples. So on the left, we have what's called an orthogonal or an ortho image. And as I mentioned, orthogonal means at a right angle to, so in this case, at a right angle, at a right angle to the ground, whereas oblique is at a slanting angle, maybe 30 degrees, 45 degrees, something like that. Uh, then we have uh, panchromatic and color images. So panchromatic images sens uh, image sensors are sensitive to a wide range of wave wavelengths along the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, these are typically typically span large bands of the visible light spectrum, um, and it's all one single uh, sensor, but it can view 
multiple uh, sections or all sections along the visible light spectrum. And that's common for a typical camera, right? Uh, a lot of remote sensing cameras on the hand are what we call uh, color uh, sensors. And what these do is we call them color because they specialize in one single color. Okay, so they focus in a very narrow segment of the electromagnetic spectrum. So color imaging sensors are sensitive to a relatively thin range of wavelengths, typically only red, green, or blue, or infrared, near infrared. Uh, multiple color band images can be layered together in what we call a composite image. So a composite image of RGB ends up looking a lot like a panchromatic image, except there's more information that can be layered upon that if multiple uh, multiple spectra are included, in which case we're talking about multi-spectrum imagery, um, which can, like I said, include uh, infrared, near-infrared, and so on. So here we have uh, panchromatic versus color. The, uh, the ways in which color bands are rendered, or which is another way of saying displayed, determines the observed image on screen. So essentially we can, we can use what's called false coloring to view um, color images. And so even though these are RGB values, they may also include near infrared. And so if we want to view near infrared, which is useful for uh, monitoring uh, moisture levels, uh, crop health, things like that, we need to uh, render something that isn't actually visible to the naked eye. right? So near infrared, we can't see with our eyes, so we have to choose a color. So near infrared tends to be rendered as a red color on screen, even though the thing that is being sensed is not actually red. So multispectral color bands are useful for observing different land cover types, uh, and as I said before, moisture content and things like that, and surface cover. So I touched on resolution last week a bit. I'll, I'll talk about it just a bit more. So uh, resolution, it's the scale of the smallest sense components relative to uh, real world size. So in the example I gave last week, essentially I was talking about like one foot on the ground is represented by uh, maybe a pixel on uh, in a photo we call that one foot resolution okay so the pixel is relative to some sort of real life measure so maybe it's a foot maybe it's six inches maybe it's one meter okay so the example here is one pixel is equal to one meter and that gives you a certain resolution that could be um, uh, ad uh, adequate for certain tasks but not adequate for others so multi-spectral images tend to sample over a large spatial extent Thus, they have a lower spatial resolution. Another element of aerial photos is distortion. So anytime you've taken a photo, you'll often find that maybe the edges of the photo have some sort of distortion, kind of like fish eye, kind of the, that fishbowl uh, effect. Uh, and so distortion is a common element of, of photography. But when it comes to orthogonal imagery, uh, every section along that photo needs to look like it's at a right angle and not tilting away from from the center so the center of a aerial image is called the principal point and then the farther from the principal point one looks the greater the distortion so there's a process known as ortho rectification ortho rectification is performed on aerial photos and it removes uh, a certain amount of relief displacement which is that that distortion that occurs uh, and it enforces the same scale across the entire photo. Um, computers can do this with software now. And so anytime you're viewing an ortho photo from Google Photos or Google Maps rather, uh, it has been ortho rectified. So what this allows for is more accurate, accurate measurements of uh, angles, uh, distances, and areas. And once they've been ortho rectified, these are known as planimetrically correct images. Next up, in the context of resolution, is what we call ground sample distance. Ground sample distance for a pixel is the distance between pixel centers in ground units. So it's essentially the spatial resolution, um, but it actually represent, it represents the actual distance uh, between the centers of each pixels, uh, equivalent to what that distance is on the ground. So it may be one foot, one meter, so on. But when it comes to remote sensing, instead of just talking about resolution, the term we use is ground sample distance. So essentially, if it's a one foot image, what that's referring to is the distance in the real world between the center of the pixel from one, one pixel to the next, represents one foot in the real world. The primary characteristic of the imagery that determines the image quality is its GSD, its ground sample distance. 
To detect and interpret most objects, many pixels are necessary. If you have very few pixels, you end up with a very low resolution image or a very small image. So you need a large amount of pixels. Obviously that increases the file size, but the higher the resolution, the greater the detail, and in, in theory, the greater the information that can be pulled from the photo. So resolution is affected by sensor optics, the atmosphere, and other factors that can blur an image. Here's an example. This would be a photo with a very large GSD, meaning a low resolution or a large ground sample distance. So from the center of one pixel to the next represents a large distance in the real world. This one I can tell you is about one or one to two meters. As it starts to increase, we see a slightly lower GSD ground sample distance. Now we're at about one foot. And here we've got something about, uh, equivalent to about six inches or so. And now we can start to see it looks like a car, right? So you need a smaller GSD to get a greater amount of detail. A couple, a couple other examples here. We've got uh, Landsat 8, which is actually a pretty um, high quality remote sensing satellite that was launched in the last 15 years or so. Um, this is a 30 meter ground sample distance uh, image on the left of an airport. You can tell it's an airport, but an airport is a large object, right? So you don't need a high resolution image. Uh, in the middle, we've got a parking lot at about 0.63 meters. And on the right, we have a uh, another parking lot at 0.1 meters, which is about four inches. So the GSD on the image on the right is about four inches in the real world from the center of one pixel to the next. Image interpretation. So image interpretation is the act of examining aerial images for the purpose of identifying objects and judging their significance. In other words, it's the act of taking raw data and pulling out actionable knowledge from that data. So GIS is about actionable intelligence, right? So spatial data allows us to make informed decisions when we can accurately assess their contents. Uh, certain degrees of subjectivity are always present in image interpretation. Essentially what it is is a uh, stimulus and response activity. Okay, so the stimuli are the elements in the image and we are responding to those elements. And because we are human, there's always a degree of subjectivity, right? So the viewer describes elements within uh, qualitative terms, likely, possibly, probably, right? So uh, with image interpretation, it's about subject, subject, uh, excuse me, subjectively identifying images by evaluating certain characteristics okay so you may never actually know with 100 percent certainty what you're looking at but you may be certain at about 95 percent perhaps 99 percent so what are the elements of image interpretation or photo interpretation in this case uh, tone size shape texture pattern shadow sight and association and i'll get into what all of those actually mean but i just want to quickly point out this graphic here on the right what we're looking at is um, more or less uh, it's a pyramid with tone and color at the top okay so notice that um, as uh, on the right side of the pyramid it goes from primary secondary tertiary on higher degrees of com complexity but on the left essentially what we're looking at is tone and color are the basic element and all the rest are just spatial arrange arrangements of that first element tone right so essentially when you're looking at an image the size, the shape, the texture, the pattern, and so on, all those are just different arrangements of the color that uh, is sensed in the image. So certain orientations or shapes um, that might be just collections of the color green, for example, could be interpreted to be like a pasture or a field or something like that. But ultimately, it all starts with uh, tone and color in an image, right? Because you can't actually feel the texture with your hands. You have to view it. It's all about the actual image. Okay. So tone will be the color or the brightness of the objects. So in this case, we say tone, we're thinking color, right? Size, that would be the size of the objects in relation to adjacent objects. So if you're looking at a photo, you don't really know if something is big or small without context. So that's why you have to take other adjacent nearby objects into account to kind of gauge the size of the object. Shape, um, when you're looking at the shape, sometimes you can tell whether something is uh, natural or man-made 
you know, natural features tend to uh, lack right angles and things that are a little harder for nature to come up with, straight lines, things like that. Texture, those are distinctive variations of tones across an object. So maybe it's uh, the pattern of, you know, lines of strawberry plants or um, apple trees or something like that, some sort of texture that makes them stand out from the adjacent areas. Pattern, kind of similar to the example I just gave, uh, the spatial arrangement of objects that may be natural or man-made. In this case, if it's a field of orange trees, they're going to follow a certain pattern. There's probably going to be some symmetry to it, like certain lines that are parallel to one another. Maybe they have the same number of trees in every single row. So there are patterns that we can then identify. Um, shadow, those are the shading cast by an object's mass. So if it's a tall building, it's likely going to cast a relatively long shadow. Uh, if it's a building that's shaped like a dome, it may have a kind of dome-shaped shadow and so on. Uh, site will be the location of objects in space. And this, in this context, it's like the um, exact site, so like the coordinates. And then there's association. That would be the relative location. So site would be absolute location. Association is the relative location, relative to other objects uh, nearby. I'll give you examples of that in a bit. So here we have an example of tone, uh, the color, the brightness of the object, the intensity of radiation captured by the sensor. And as I talked about in the past, it could be a panchromatic image, it could be a photo, Im uh, excuse me, a color image that's then uh, stacked with RGB values to make a composite image. It could be a multispectral image where we're looking at infrared, right? But it's all about the tone. In this case here, size, the size of objects in relation to others, a uh, car versus a bus, a single family home versus a multifamily, and in this case here we have um, pyramids versus uh, what look like multifamily homes or apartments or a dense urban landscape out to the east. Shape, uh, so as I mentioned before, man-made features tend to have straight lines, right angles, symmetry, whereas nature is not always so, so perfect, right? Natural features tend to display meanders, acute or obtuse angles, and asymmetry. In this example here, we've got a port, man-made port with some straight lines, some symmetry, compared to the meandering river that dumps out right next to it. Texture, those are the distinctive variations of tones across uh, the landscape. Um, maybe could be identified as a coarse or a smooth or checkered texture. Uh, pattern, it's just a spatial arrangement of objects. And here we can identify uh, patterns uh, in the uh, case of cars parked in a parking lot, parking stalls, um, air conditioning units on top of the large warehouse. So there are certain patterns that can be viewed. And shadow, as I mentioned before, that's the uh, shading cast by an object's mass. In this example, we're looking at the Colosseum in Rome, and sure enough, it has uh, more or less a Colosseum-shaped shadow to the north. And this is useful for determining height and depth of objects. It doesn't just work with tall, subject, uh, tall objects, it also works with deep objects as well. Um, in this case here, looking down into the bowl of the Colosseum, or maybe into a shaft mine or something like that. Um, and then we've got location, uh, both absolute and relative. So site would be the... Um, object's exact location in terms of coordinates, and the association will be the relative location of the object um, related to nearby objects. So here we have a baseball field, uh, which may be in Cyprus with exact coordinates, but also happens to be nearby a school, and that school may be nearby a neighborhood, and so on and so forth. All right, so this example here, I tend to, I do this in class, obviously, usually, uh, and so I tend to ask students um, if they can give me examples. I don't have any students that I can actually interact with at this moment, so I'll just kind of give you my own examples here. So tone, looking at tone on the landscape, the tone uh, gradient or difference that stands out most to me. This image was taken when um, Galaxy's Edge was being built in Disneyland, and so the dirt, the dirt of the construction site up in the north uh, east, excuse me, excuse me, northwest corner of Disneyland, size. Uh, the example here talked about the rivers of America there, right? It's a very large, essentially like looking like a large lazy river. It's a, a large kind of pond that goes around in a circle. Um, shape, the example here, I came up with a space mountain because it's more or less looks like a perfect circle from this, this height. I guess you could also choose uh, 
the center there, the little center circle of Disneyland where you go out to each of the lands. Uh, texture. And I went with these trees here, which would be uh, the Jungle Cruise. Pattern. I chose the little uh, turnstiles or ticket gates down there between Disneyland and uh, California Adventure. Shadow. I tried to find a, a tall subject. The best I could come up with was a Matterhorn. You can see the shadow there on the, the east side of the mountain. And finally, site. We have the exact coordinates of Disneyland. And then its association would be its relative location. Well, we could say it's in Anaheim, uh, just south of I-5. All right, next up, we're going to talk about photogrammetry, which is more the uh, if, uh, if photo or image interpretation is about subjectivity, photogrammetry is more about objectivity. Right? So photogrammetry is the science of obtaining reliable measurements by means of photography. So it's relying on computers to help us measure objects uh, based off of known anchor points on the ground for the most part. So one deals in probability, in this case uh, photo or image interpretation, and the other deals in precision photogrammetry. So in aerial photogrammetry, the camera is mounted on an aircraft and usually pointed orthogonally uh, towards uh, the ground. Okay, so again, remember orthogonal images are at a right angle, so measurements may be taken in real time or in post-processing. So in this case, this example, we'll say post-processing. So the image is taken, and then we use computers, GIS, for example, to measure an object. So in this case here, we have an airplane that is 122.95 feet long, which is very high precision. Information derived from imagery may be arrived at inductively or deductively. All right, so inductive, uh, we take measurements, find the average length of planes on the tarmac, and make determinations about the typical aircraft at Santa Ana Airport, John Wayne. All right. Uh, deductively, we might look for Alaska Airlines Boeing 737-800, knowing its length is 122.95 feet. If we find a plane that matches that length, then we can say we are fairly confident that it is an Alaska Airlines aircraft. Okay. Uh, and lastly, Going to briefly talk about satellite imagery. So there are two types of satellite imagery, uh, sun synchronous and geostationary. All right. So sun synchronous orbits uh, keep pace with the sun's westward progression. So they're always looking down on a, a portion of the earth that is illuminated by the sun's light. Uh, contrast that with geostationary, which are permanently uh, essentially mounted over one specific location on Earth's surface. Uh, and so then it sees nighttime, daytime, nighttime, daytime. It follows the patterns, the 24 hour pattern. Uh, but what geosynchronous orbits allow satellites to do is track change on the ground over time in one specific location. Okay. Uh, sun synchronous are better for maybe collecting data um, that maybe are for reconnaissance purposes or things that are uh, heavily rely on you know well lit areas but are not necessarily anchored to one specific location. Uh, images are taken at intervals, maybe daily, weekly, biweekly. Uh, so if it's uh, geosynchronous, that means that half the time the the subject of the satellite's remote sensing camera is going to be dark when it's facing away from the sun. The other half of the day, it's lit. So in that case, there's no reason necessarily to take photos 24 hours a day if the sun is only illuminating that portion of the Earth 12 hours a day, right? Um, Landsat images are acquired every 16 days. And then we have Sentinel. We have other satellite arrays that uh, go more frequently than that. All right, so a bit about satellite, uh, Landsat satellite specifically. So Landsat was launched in 1972. It is the longest continually operational satellite imaging program. NASA obviously runs that. Uh, Land, Landsat 7 was launched in 1999. It, it um, contained an enhanced thematic mapper uh, that had a higher resolution imager, uh, 15 meter spatial resolution, as well as panchromatic imager, which has an even higher resolution than uh, the um, the 15 meter color 
Okay, Landsat 8 was launched in 2013, so it's the, the latest Landsat satellite. It has an operational land imager, which is uh, the newest sensor, a nine band multi spectral imager, including a 30 meter color plus near infrared and infrared sensor, uh, and a, a 15 meter panchromatic. Also includes a thermal infrared sensor. Uh, which is used used for monitoring, um, obviously, as it implies, thermal locations. So uh, forest fires, volcanic activity, things that involve uh, high, high temperatures. And that's at 100 meter spatial resolution, which is low resolution, but good enough for tracking uh, wildfires and things of that nature. So how does a remote sensing sensor work? What's it actually capturing? Well, it's capturing electromagnetic energy. Okay, so electromagnetic energy are essentially, in this case, uh, segments along the electromagnetic spectrum. So how do we, uh, how do these wavelengths work? What is a long wave uh, uh, segment versus a short wave segment? What that's talking about is the distance between the crests of two different waves. So short wave radiation, uh, which includes things like ultraviolet light, x-rays, gamma rays, and so on, uh, have very, very short wavelengths something like on the scale of uh, an atom, right? Whereas longer wavelengths have much longer uh, distances between the peaks of those waves. Um, and those would be on the scale of like a meter, like the length of a car or a couple of cars, or even longer, all right? So up to a kilometer long for uh, infrared, or uh, sorry, long wave. Uh, we've just got another example here of the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, it's a range of light energy, uh, and the segment of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can see is relatively short. It runs from around 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers, and that's from uh, violet to red. Uh, the electromagnetic spectrum is generally measured in micrometers, so in this case here, but we use nanometers. If you want to do micro, you just drop off two zeros. So we have 0.4 micrometers to 0.7 micrometers. So gamma and x-ray are at the top of the spectrum. Those are the shortest wavelengths, the very, very short wave radiation. Ultraviolet is between 0.01 to 0.4 micrometers. Uh, the visible spectrum, blue is 0.4 to 0.5, green 0.5 to 0.6 red 0.6 to 0.7, uh, near infrared, middle infrared, and far infrared all occupy from around 0.7 to about 14 micrometers, and then microwave and radio waves are uh, at the bottom or the, the longest wavelengths along the spectrum. So I, I touched on this last week a bit, but raster bands are essentially collections of uh, electromagnetic energy that has been sensed along very specific narrow bands of the light spectrum. Okay, so images are stored as a raster and have one or more bands. If it's three band RGB, that would be a composite image that looks something similar to what you'd see with the naked eye. If it has four or five, six, up to nine bands, those are all what we call hyperspectral or multispectral bands. And those can be infrared, near infrared, and so on and so forth. Multispectral images have four or more bands, as I said each of which is spectrally narrow and extends beyond what the eye can see. As I said before, when displaying an image, the display monitor only has three channels, RGB, um, that can be used to actually mimic uh, what the human eye can see. In summary, remote sensing allows us to attempt to interpret areas without having to physically visit them. So it's about sensing locations that are remote or distant from the viewer. The technology to capture remotely sensed images has evolved throughout the years and will continue to evolve. And photo interpretation and photogrammetry are techniques for understanding and interpreting images captured by sensors. Photogram photogrammetry is more of a science. Uh, image interpretation is more of an art. Image interpretation more subjective. Photogrammetry more objective. Uh, and images are records of electromagnetic energy from shorter to longer wavelengths. All right, so thank you so much for uh, tuning into this week's lecture. I look forward to chatting with you all soon.